main thing that I've been working on since the last time I was here is a notion that uh, I call and other people call ubiquitous learning. Um, and by that we mean that learning is no longer, especially with technology and wireless connectivity, learning is no longer an, a, an experience or activity that's limited to formal educational institutions, but it's now happening in many places, in the home, in the workplace, in the coffee house, um, and for young people especially, the mobility and portability of these devices means that learning also becomes an anytime, anywhere activity. We traditionally think about the distinction between formal and informal education, uh, what happens in schools and what happens other places. I think increasingly we need to see these things in a relationship to each other and to rethink school activities in relationship to what's happening in these other environments and in the other direction for the schools to bring experiences and learning that takes place in the other, these other environments into the classroom and into the school, especially for high school students and adolescents. The idea of a wheel with spokes, with the school is the hub of the wheel, and the spokes connect that hub to the, these other learning environments. These other spaces are different, but the school is the one place that they share. The tremendous research opportunity that you have to study what's happening in this transformed learning environment and to look at new forms of learning, new ways in which students collaborate and work with each other, what it actually means in a, to changing the process of learning when we put it in this ubiquitous, sort of multi-dimensional, multi-faceted uh, uh, context. As learning becomes more social and more collaborative, um, does that change the motivation of learners to, um, to think beyond um, learning this for myself or learning this because I'm going to be graded on it to a, a, a more collective sense of learning together um, and sharing our learning with each other. That's certainly what's happening on the World Wide Web more generally. Um, uh, and I think that there, there hasn't been a lot of investigation as far as I know about how the learning process itself and the motivational process it, itself changes for young people who are thinking about this learning in this set of social relationships. The second motivational question is uh, what, uh, again, I don't know what the expression is in Spanish, but in English it's situated learning. That is, learning in the context of situations or problems that one faces immediately and then applying the learning that one takes to that specific problem or situation that people are dealing with. That I think also leads to a different kind of motivational structure because I'm not learning something in context A and then applying it to context B. I'm often learning it in the context, whether it's the workplace or whatever, that I immediately need that information. A third research question, especially given the, the structure of the program you've created, is what happens to other people in the student's family in their community, in their neighborhood? How does learning transfer or get extended from what the student is learning to what they bring home to their family, their parents, their family members, or, or their neighbors, or other people in their community? I think what's really exciting about the model you've developed is that the, 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 the learning of the student becomes a potential lever to trigger sort of secondary learning that also takes place for other people um, who may not themselves have direct access to technology. I understand why teachers find this threatening. It's threatening because it's new and it's difficult and it's a, it's a change and that's always difficult for people. The teachers need to see this not as a threat but as an opportunity and an opportunity to, re to refresh and to reform their teaching in some very exciting ways. There's a race going on um, and the race is between the ability of traditional educational institutions to reform and adapt themselves to this new environment. The race between those institutions and other entities that are beginning to provide these e-learning opportunities, including the private sector, who aren't burdened by some of the characteristics of the traditional school institution and bureaucracy. The schools can't afford to lose this race. Uh, because learners will have these other opportunities um, and they have the choice of taking advantage of them. 
Um, I'm not saying they're better, I'm just saying that they might be in some ways more responsive to the needs and interests of learners and there isn't a monopoly anymore by the traditional institutions. My own personal involvement is more at the level of higher education, as I said, the issues also relate to higher education, but um, uh, schools can't afford to lose, I think, this competition. Why in a field of innovation as important as the new technologies, there are few countries that have taken the massive strategies. There's probably different answers in different countries. Um, in the United States, which is a co country I know pretty well, there's a limit of, because of just the legal structure of things, there's a limit of how much the national government can impose reforms across the whole country. Um, and so I think one trend is often there's a decentralizing move to put these reforms more at a piecemeal level and not across the board reforms. I mean, I just learned this morning that the three million laptop innovation is the largest reform anywhere. Three million laptops is a that's a that's a big change, you know, and it has potentially huge implications. I think a lot of other countries, not only in Latin America but around the world, are going to be looking at what Argentina does in this area. I think that's one reason why research is so important. Not just implementing these changes, but studying them, researching them, writing about them, and share that, sharing that information about what works and what doesn't work with other countries that are dealing with some of the same kinds of issues as your country. <coughs> Something that we did at Illinois was to create a network, a statewide network of teachers, in this case beginning teachers, novice teachers, and we put them in co contact with each other through this network. This wasn't only about technology issues, but it was about beginning teachers who could share with each other, here's some things that have happened, here's some problems I'm running into, um, I tried this, this is what worked, other people can see what other people tried. It's building a sense of community among these beginning teachers who sometimes feel very isolated in what they're experiencing. A second aspect of this is to develop a sense among these teachers that they are a vanguard not just as individuals, but collectively in a major national innovation. So that they're individually feeling, even if they don't have support sometimes within their school, that they are part of a larger movement with other teachers with whom they're in contact, who are dealing with some of the, uh, that are committed to some of the same goals. Uh, and so one last piece of this might be um, a website uh, that they share, where they can share lesson plans and maybe you do something like this already, where they can share lesson plans, where they can um, uh, uh, maybe see videos of one another's classrooms, or uh, this idea, again, of a shared space that is their space, that's part of their reform, um, so they can both substantively share some of the things that they're doing with each other, but again, also feel part of something which is distributed and, and national and not just local.